Uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want you guys to open up your Bible, if you brought your Bible, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. If, if we're going to be in a couple, I'm going to share uh, different verses with you, but if you just stay in 1 Samuel, you're cool. If you want to follow us to Ephesians chapter 5, Matthew 6, and Proverbs 4, that's great as well. But I'm always going to go back in this message, in today's lesson, um, I'm going to constantly be going back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a story that, that many of you um, know that um, is, is the story of David and Goliath, uh, the story of David and Goliath. And, and many people, they just know uh, the, the story of Goliath as, of David and Goliath as just that. You know, David, a young man, uh, gets some stones and with a slingshot kills Goliath. Goliath is a giant and, and then that's about it. That's, and that's about it of what people know about David. But the story of David and Goliath is, is bigger than that. As a matter of fact, the story of how David got there in the first place is an interesting story. And that entire story, you find it in 1 Samuel chapter 17. But because it's a long chapter, we're not going to read every verse. We're just going to read 80% of it. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to read 80%. And, uh, but, but we're going to read a good portion of it. But I want to sort of lead you up to this. Is David is a young man who was out in the fields taking care of a few sheep. Um, he, he was kind of a quirky little kid, you know, he, he liked to play the harp, I don't know, and he liked to write poems, right? And his brothers, they just kind of saw him as the runt of the family. Uh, he had uh, three older brothers who had joined the military, and they had followed the king, King Saul, to battle, and they went to go fight against the Philistines. But we have to remember that we're talking about thousands of years ago. There was no Facebook. There's no Instagram. There's no um, FaceTime. There's no Zoom. There's no text messaging. There's no emails. There's no uh, news, uh, you know, 24-hour news cycle. So Jesse, David's dad, decides to, get, to send David to the camp. And he gives him some bread. He gives him some cheese. He gives him some tortas, some tacos, right? And he's like, hey... Take this to your brothers. Take this to the captains of your brothers. See how things are going. Then come back and let me know how are your brothers. Let me know what's going on, what's up. And, and, and this is sort of the, the, the base of where we're going to start um, today in our reading. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20. Let's read verse 20. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out, now I want you to pay attention to this, set out early the next morning, all right, early the next morning with gifts, as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. So he shows up to the camp, they're lined up, they're ready to, they're ready to fight, they're yelling, they're doing these shouts and battle cries, and, and suddenly these guys are talking, because this giant starts coming up, Goliath. And these guys say, hey man, do you know what the king would do for whoever kills this giant? Right. Now let me tell you that the nation of Israel had their own giant. They had their own big bad dude. His name was Saul, the king. Right. The Bible says that his shoulders were above the heads of all the men of Israel. But he was afraid or fearful, and he didn't want to confront the giant. So instead, he was looking for someone to confront him. And these men are talking, and David shows up early, uh, shows up, I'm sorry, uh, to the camp to, with the gifts that his dad had sent, and he hears these guys talking. And, and I'll share with you a couple of things. They're like, whoever kills the giant, their dad won't have to pay taxes anymore. Just David was like, well, I like that, man. We, have to, we don't have to worry about April, right? And then another one they said was like, whoever kills the giant, the king will give him one of his daughters to marry. And David was like, well, I really like that, right? You know, he's a teenage boy, right? He's like, I really like that. And let me tell you, she ended up being bad news, but that's another story for another time, right? We're talking about Father's Day, right? You know, today. But anyways, so he's like, well, what? And so verse uh, 27 says, and these men gave David the same reply. And they said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. 28. But when David's oldest brother Eliab heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyways, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? He's trying to insult him. I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. 29. 
What have I done? I was only asking a question, David replied, 30. He walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's questions was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. 32, don't worry about the Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're just a little boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. I'm going to share with y'all a story. I didn't share this in any service, but because of the way this reads, it totally reminded me of this story. There used to be this restaurant called Bennigan's. Anybody remember Bennigan's? All right. So, no me dejan mentir. All right. The one time a bunch of us youth after church, I think we went to a Christian concert or something. Then we went to eat at, at Bennigan's. And um, I'm not going to mention his name. I'm just going to say he sings worship in the Spanish services. And so y'all know who I'm talking about. And um, he ordered this burger called the Big Irish. You can imagine how big the burger was. It was called the Big Irish, right? And so the manager, era una morenita, the manager comes out. We, like they bring all the food, but she brings out the Big Irish, right? So she comes out and she's like, who got the Big Irish, right? And so I'm sitting across my friend and, you know, it's a long bunch of us. And so my friend is like, and she goes, you, you, you got the big eye? She goes, oh my, I brought it out thinking I was going to see this big hunk of man. But you, you're just a little guy like that. <laughs> he was like all embarrassed. Let me tell you, he did not finish the big Irish and I paid. But anyways, different story for another time. <laughs> but anyways, this reminded me of that. Sal is like, you, you, you're just a little guy, right? Like you, you, you're a little guy. You can't possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. Verse 34. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. He's a bad dude. Verse 36. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said. And may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. Dads, listen up. Like the nation of Israel, you too are in the middle of a battle. Right? You too are in the middle of a battle. Right? And, 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 and the sad thing is that there's so many dads, so many fathers that do not realize that they're in the middle of a battle and, and, and you're married to a person uh, that does not realize that you're in the middle of a battle and you're raising kids that do not realize that you're in the middle of a battle. But dads, listen up. You are in a battle. You're in the middle of a war. And this battle has three fronts, all right? The battle has three fronts. One of the fronts is the battle for your time. Another front is the battle for your mind. And then the third front I'm going to talk about is the battle for your heart. Let's read verse 20. Verse 20 says, so David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out, notice, early the next morning with the gifts, as Jesse has directed him. He arrived at the camp just as, that's time, the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Notice, notice the time frames. There was a moment where David received an order from his father. The next morning, that's another time, David leaves the sheep with another shepherd, heads out. By the time he arrives with the army at the battlefield, they are in a, their own time. It is the time where they leave for the battlefield with shouts of battle shouts and battle cries, right? Now notice that there's these different time frames. The Bible says that there's a time, there's a season for everything, right? 
There's a time, there's a season for everything. And dad, you need to learn and you need to understand that you need to rule, manage, dominate your time because if you don't, then time will rule, manage, and dominate you. Right? If you don't rule your time, time will rule you. That's why so many people walk around like, oh, I'm always running late. I'm always running late. That's why so many people walk around like, oh man, there's just not, there's just not enough time. You know, there's just not enough time. Man, I'm constantly running out of time because you're not ruling your time. You're not managing your time. Your time is ruling over you. The time is managing over you. And as you rule, manage your time, you begin to understand that there's a time, a season for everything. There is a time for work. But then there's a time to come home from work. When you are home, there is a time for your wife. There's a time for your children. And there's a time for rest. You need to be able to manage that. Because the enemy is constantly trying to rob you from your time. I, I, I listened to the, to the message, to the testimony that Carlos and Omar shared about their father. I've known the Medellin family for many years, many, many years. Both of those boys graduated from your school, Pueblo's Road Christian School. They, they joined the school when the school first opened. Their mother is, is, is um, the, uh, an original teacher from the school and continues to teach at the school. I had a good relationship with their father who has gone on to be with the Lord, with Hermano Medellin. Carlos, he's a musician. His father bought him a guitar. Omar's an artist. His father would buy him paper and, and pens and pencils and, 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 and markers and paint. Carlos and Omar both went to college. Their father helped paying for their education. But if you notice in the testimony, they didn't talk about the guitar. They didn't talk about art supply. They didn't talk about that their father helped pay for their schooling. What they talked about was the time that their father spent with them. What they talked about was the legacy of having their father pray over them, spending time praying over them. What they talked about was the legacy of in his retirement, that he was able to take care of the first three years of his grandson to spend all that time all day long. That's what they talked about the time. They didn't talk about the latest Jordans. They didn't talk about how do the kids call the, 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 those Nikes today? What do they call them? Dunks or what do they call them? What do they call them? Yes, dunks. They didn't talk about the latest dunks that Supreme just released. I was, I was sharing in the last service, and my mom's here, my sister's here as my witness. My mom used to buy us shoes for school, new shoes for school at a store. I don't even know if the store's still open. The store was called Payless. Payless. Right? I, I, I still remember this. The tennis shoes, they were called Pro Wings. And the dress shoes, they were called... Um, Coasters, I think that's what, that was, that was the, 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 the model, right? So she would buy us pro wings and coasters. You buy a fourth grader pro wings today, ah, oh, este va a desmayar. <laughs> no, pass out. Anyways, I don't even know how I got on that. I'm just saying, though, right? <laughs> Dads, there's a battle for your time. And I'm not going to ask, are you winning or losing? Because I know that many of you are losing. I know sometimes I'm losing. My daughter, uh, Rebecca and Raquel, uh, they like to play a game. And um, so I'm, I'm home and, and they will tell me, freeze. And I'll just freeze. I don't know why I always freeze with my mouth open. <laughs> I do. Every time, freeze. I'm like, every time. And one time, Rebecca's like, freeze. And I'm like, 
And she comes up to me and she'll like pick up my hands and then she'll like put this on there and then she'll say, unfreeze. And I'll be like, hey, what's going on? You know, like what happened? I'm like, did you freeze me? And they'll laugh, right? And then they'll be like, freeze. And, and so I'll freeze like this. And then like they'll put one hand behind my back and one head on my head and then they'll be like, unfreeze like that. And so one time she's like, freeze. And I'm like, and Rebecca comes in and does this to my mouth. <laughs> Shuts my mouth. We were driving the other day, and she's like, Papi, I want ice cream. I'm like, you know, the way you ask for ice cream, I sure wish you would ask for broccoli. I do. And she goes, but broccoli makes me throw up, which is true. Broccoli makes her throw up. But I'm like, ah, how convenient. But anyways, you know. Like so I'm like, you know, I wish you would say, Papi, I want broccoli. Papi, I want carrots. Papi, I, 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 want, I want sopita. Papi, I, I want carnita. Papi, I, I, I want pollo. I wish you would say that. And while I'm driving, I'm like telling her this, and all of a sudden she's like, freeze. <laughs> so I'm like, unfreeze me, unfreeze me, unfreeze me. It's dangerous, unfreeze me. Right, like that. Sometimes we're at home. And she's like, Papi, let's play follow the leader. And I'm like, hold on, hold on, let, 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 me, let me, you know, after you send this text, after you reply to this email, after you see one more reel on Instagram, hold on, hold on, I'm busy, I'm busy. She's like, like, Papi, let, let, let's play hide and go seek, Papi. And I'm like, hold on, hold on, man, hold on, hold on, hold on. And, 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 and then Raquelita's like, yeah, Papi, let's play dinosaurs, right? Which is uh, our way of playing tag, but I'm just a dinosaur chasing them, right? I'm like, hold on, hold on. And, and so after a while, you know what Rebecca does? Rebecca goes, freeze. And I'll be like, and she'll close my mouth and she'll get my cell phone and she'll go hide it. And then she comes back and she'll say, unfreeze. And I'll feel so horrible because I'm losing in the battle on the front that we call time. So I don't need to ask you, dad, are you winning in the battle for your time? Because I know if I'm losing, you losing. We're in the same boat. We're part of the same army. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Another way of saying this is make the most of your time in these evil days. Don't act up. Thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Verse 16, one more time. Make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of your time in these evil days. Right? Let me tell you that there's a battle for your time. Right? Entertainment is trying to fight for your time. Your friends are trying to fight for your time. Work. Trying to fight for your time. Screen time is trying to fight for your time. We're in the middle of a battle and we're losing on the front that we call time. Okay. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the man, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. Some, some theologians say that this could be translated as saying, you just want to be seen in the battle. In other words, you just want to take a selfie that you're here, post it on Instagram, like, yeah, fighting in the battle with my brothers. Taking out them Philistines. North side, right? I don't know. You know, some game, right? You know, like that. That's what he's telling them. Verse 29 says that, David says, what have I done now? I was only asking a question. Verse 30 says, he walked over to some others and asked them the same thing. In other words, he, he's talking here, his brother's hating on him. He tells his brother, what's up, man? And he goes somewhere else and talks over here. David understood what his brother didn't understand. That the fight, the battle, wasn't amongst the brothers. The fight, the battle was with the Philistine. The fight, the battle was with the giant. 
the fight, the battle was with Goliath. He understood in his mind what his brother did not comprehend. See, his brother, like King Sal, saw the giant and was like, oh, like we used to say when we were in elementary. He was, they were scared of the giant and David's inquiring like, so if I kill this dude, like what's going to happen? I'll take him out. What's going to happen? David's trying to inquire about that. And his brother, instead of being rough and tough and muy bravo, as we say, with the giant, he's rough and tough and bravo with his brother. I was remembering last service, um, you know, I have an older brother. He's four years older than I am. And that's an awkward age difference. Because when he was a teen, 13, I was nine years old. You know, teenager want to be with their nine-year-old brother, right? When he was 16, I was 12, right? In those days, 16, you start getting your license. So he's, he's ready to drive. He don't, want, he don't want to hang out with me. He's 18, 19. I'm like 14. He, he don't want to hang out with me. And, um, you know, after church, like the, like the youth of the church, they used to go out to eat. They go to different places. And I would always want to go with him. And my mom would tell me in Spanish, pegate, right? Like stick to him, you know? And so I would just go with him. And him and all his friends, they were all older than me. Um, they would call me chicle. Chicle is like gum. Like I was stuck to the bottom of his shoe. So wherever he went, chicle would go. And they would be like, chicle, pass the chips. And chicle, go to the car and, you know, get, you know, get, get whatever, right? You know, and chicle this and chicle that. And him and all his friends, they would come. I didn't care because I was there. <laughs> so they called me chicle all I want. I was there, right? So I don't care. They called me chicle like that. And sometimes my brother and I, we would fight. Who has, who has a, a brother? Anybody here have a brother? All right. If you never fought with your brother, leave your hand up. You never fought. Isn't that amazing right there? Every, every brother is always fought. But that's what makes brothers brothers. And so we would fight, but we would fight like, I mean, like we would throw down. That's why he's in karate now, you know, like he's, he wants revenge. You know? I'm just kidding. And uh, my dad, he would like come and like break us up, you know, after my mom would get all scared, like, you know, after we'd break a wall or knock down a vase or something, you know, and, like my mom would, would be yelling, so my dad, yeah, se fastidiaba, and, and so se fastidiaba, and so my dad would come, and, and my dad was like Superman, you know, he would just like, boom, like just pull us apart, you know, like, like, like go to y'all's room, you know, like that. And so he would say, hey, 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 muy bravos, muy bravos. And then like, allá en la escuela con los bullies, I can say bravos allá, you know, like, like be tough with the bullies at school, you're tough here, be tough over there. And it was true because, you know, I remember I was in middle school and there was a bully. And every time he passed by, I was like. <laughs> but my brother, who was four years older than that bully, bigger than that bully, like, what's up, what's up, man, I'll take you out right now. You know, like, it's true. And that, then Eliab, that, that's a trap that Eliab fell in. He didn't understand. The battle happening in his mind. He was confused. So he's trying to fight with his brother. But David understood. No, no, no. There's a battle. I'm not going to lose it in my mind. I'm not going to have beef with my brother. Not when the real enemy is right there. He was not distracted by his brother. Let me tell you, Dad. Let me tell you, Dad. Pops. Papa. Padres entre nosotros, listen, you're distracted. You are distracted. Don't tell me you're not. I know you are. I'm distracted. You're distracted. Our mind is everywhere but being present. Our mind is, is there, our mind is on work, our, our mind is on how we're going to pay for this, our mind is, is on social media. I'm going to say something that no one in church wants to talk about. There aren't a lot of pastors that even want to mention this word. But there's a lot of men in the church that are losing the battle in their mind because you're addicted to pornography. Because you're addicted to pornography. You're a good guy. You come to church. You're a good guy. You have a Bible. You're a good guy. You know the worship songs. You're a good guy. You're serving in your community. Your wife would say you're a good husband. Your kids would say you're a good dad. You're a good guy. But man, pornography doesn't got a grip of you. 
And you could quit one day. You could quit one week. Uh, you, hey, you did real good. You quit for one month. Or you tell yourself, I could quit anytime. I, I, any, anytime I want, I can stop. But pornography got a hold of you. Right? And, and let me tell you, that when an addiction like pornography gets a hold of you, he doesn't want to let go. He doesn't want to let go. It's always more. That's the addiction of any, that's the addiction to drugs, chasing the, that high, that first high, chasing that dopamine, chasing that, the next high, chasing a better high. Ch and, and so, you know, so it goes from weed to coke to heroin to meth to, right? It's just constantly chasing it, chasing it, chasing it. It's, it's chasing the same thing. Pornography is the same thing. It's that dopamine rush. You're just chasing the chase. That, that's the reason that you can come home and spend 30 minutes just looking at reels, just or, or Snapchat or uh, um, what, what's the one that has like reels? TikTok, thank you. Just looking at TikTok videos, scrolling, scrolling, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, because you're addicted to that dopamine that's just boom, 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 boom. And you're, you numb out. You just numb out. So many, so many of us men here in church that we should be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We should be filled with abundant life because the Spirit of Christ is in us. Instead, we're numbed out. We're numb. I mean, I share the story that uh, I had a good friend in high school. We used to go to his house after high school. And his dad, every day, Get home from work, go to the fridge, get two tall boys, sit outside, put those two beers under his seat. Kids were running in, running out. It was a bunch of them. He was a single dad. He would just stare at the street. Slowly drink one tall boy, grab that other one. Slowly drink it. And the kids were running. I mean, the house was a mess, everything. And... He'd get up, eat something, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, kids would tell him something and be like, yeah, 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 yeah. He was doing the best he can, but he was numbed out. He's doing the best he can. He's a good man. He was doing the best he can, but he was numbed out. It's a battle for your mind. One of the fronts is your time. Another front is your mind. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 says... Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. The battle in your mind is being fought with your eyes. Dad, where's your eyes? Dad, where are you fixing your eyes? Dad, where's your eyes? Dad, where are you fixing your eyes? What is it that, that's coming in through these eyes? Is it light or is it darkness? Is it light or what's harmless? It's not that big of a deal. I'm not hurting anyone. It's just to get some release. There's a battle for your time and you're losing, there's a battle for your mind, and you're losing. Last thing, there's a battle for your heart. Right? There's a battle for your heart. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 37. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the, this Philistine. Saul finally consented, all right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. You know, God's people, they didn't have a king. They didn't always have a king. But way before the days of David and, and before King Saul, Jacob blessed his 12 sons. And amongst his sons was one named Judah. And when he blessed Judah, he blessed Judah that, hey, if we ever have a king, the king is going to be from the tribe of Judah. That's why Jesus is called the Lion of Judah, because that was the prophecy that was given. The scepter would not depart from this tribe. But the people didn't have a king, 
But they looked at the nations around them. They looked north, south. They looked everywhere. And they're like, hey, all the nations have a king, but we don't have a king. So they come with the prophet Samuel and they're like, hey, everybody has a king. We don't have a king. We want a king. And the prophet who represented God tells them, no, 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 you don't want a king. Because let me tell you, if you have a king, he's going to tax you. If he has a king, he's going to take your daughters as servants. If you have a king, he's going to take your young men and take them to war. And the people were like, we don't care, we want a king. So God says, you want a king, give him a king. And they give them Saul. Saul, as I mentioned earlier, he's a big dude. He was, his shoulders were above the heads of all the men. He's the guy that we would have picked as king. And he was a good guy, man. He was. First part of his life, he was a great man. There's a problem though. Saul wasn't from the tribe of Judah. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. And when the kingdom is taken away from him, the prophet Samuel told Saul, because of your disobedience to God, God is going to take away the throne from you. He goes, but he would have established your throne forever. Even though he would, the prophecy wasn't for him, God would have made an exception for him. God would have blessed him. But he broke away. So God looks at throughout the land of Israel and he looks throughout the land and he finds this kid who was kind of quirky. He was a tough guy, but at the same time, he liked to be out by himself playing the harp, writing poems. But he had a heart for God. And God says, I choose David to be my king. And the Bible several times mentions that David was a man who followed the heart of God, who sought the heart of God. David had a heart for God. Right? Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 tells us, men, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 tells you, dads, fathers, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 tells you, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart. Dad, you need to learn to guard your heart. You need to teach your children to guard their hearts. Dads, you have daughters, you need to teach them to guard their hearts. You have sons, you need to teach them to guard their hearts. You need to guard their heart. Now, I'm going to say something. Right? Moms, wives, listen to what I'm about to say. There's a lot of men, there's a lot of dads, that are walking around and they're hurt, they're injured, but they will never tell you that they're hurt or they're injured. All the pressure is on them. Go to work. Man, we need this house, we need a bigger house. Oh, look at the neighbors painting their house. We need to remodel our house. Oh, look, my sister got a new car. We need a new car. Let's go to vacation. All right, let's go to San Antonio. San Antonio, look, my cousin just went to Cancun. Everybody went and stayed at this resort. Let me ask her which resort and how much. And your husband may not say it, but in his mind, he's just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> then he pulls out the calculator to check his air math. Right? <laughs> Where are we going to go eat? I thought you were going to cook. <laughs> <laughs> it's Father's Day. You're not going to make barbecue? It's Father's Day. <laughs> You want me to cook? It's, it's, it's Father's Day. It's pressure, it's pressure, it's pressure. Here's my list for my birthday. Here's my list for Christmas. Here's my list for Mother's Day. Here's my list for Mexican Mother's Day. It's pressure, it's pressure, it's pressure, it's pressure. And the kids... When, you know, sometimes Nayeli, she'll ask me for something, and I'm like, oh, yeah, babe, maybe I'll, I'll buy it. And then, uh, and then I'll go, but don't worry, because 14 years from now, I'm going to explain to Rebecca that I can't help pay for college because you wanted new Nikes. Just know that. <laughs> it's 
It's pressure, it's pressure, it's pressure, it's pressure, it's pressure. I'm going to share with you a personal opinion. This is not my wife's opinion. This is Pastor Ruben's personal opinion. I'd rather my wife have a $20 purse with $1,000 in it than to have a $1,000 purse and ni tiene 20 pesos para meterle. And believe me, your husband believes the same thing. Believe me, your husband feels the same way. He just doesn't want to cause any drama. He's just like, okay, well, that's the person you want. It's pressure, it's pressure. And then he walks around with these wounds in his heart because he didn't have the dad you expect him to be. He didn't see his mom have the husband you expect him to be. His dad didn't tell him, at a boy, when they won that little league game. His dad high-fived some other kid in front of him, but didn't high-five him after he got the out. His dad valued sports, but he was good at math. Or he was good at playing the flute or the clarinet. <laughs> and he walks around still an eight-year-old boy with a wound, but you're looking at a 40-year-old man and you expect him to act a certain way and be a certain way and do certain things, yet you have no idea that there's still an eight-year-old boy who's still embarrassed because he peed his bed at night and his dad made a snarky comment. So a lot of, last service, after I finished, this young man came with tears in his eyes, shook my hand and said, Pastor, thank you for saying a lot of things that need to be said. There's a battle going on for your time, for your mind, for your heart. So many of the men, fathers present are wounded. Man, I married a good one. He's a hard worker. He's always at work. He's always at work because he don't want to come home. He's always at work because he don't want to come home. And you know why he doesn't want to come home? Because at work, he's a boss. At work, he's a manager. At work, he's a supervisor. At work, when he works hard, the, if he has a good boss, the boss comes and tells him, hey man, you did good today. At work, uh, someone will come and say, hey, thanks for helping. At work, someone else will come and say, hey man, I appreciate that you came early and you stayed late so we can get the job done. At work, come December, you know what? Here's a little bonus. But then he leaves work and he goes home. And at home, there's no good job there's no thank you for this. At home, it's gimme, 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 gimme. Do, 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 do. Provide, 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 provide. And you never help out. You never do this. You're good for nothing. You know, you're not a real man. Look at my cousin's husband. You know, like, man, he liked me before he married her. I should have married him. You know, like. That's why your husband a hard worker and spends more time at work than at home. Like, there are guys in the military that they'll spend 15, 16 years in the military. They, they've got a rank. They're a sergeant, right? They decide that they're gonna retire, they get out of the military, and they come to be a civilian, and as a civilian, they gotta start on the bottom, because they done spent 15 years in the army, so they gotta start on the bottom. In the military, they had a rank. Over here, they have nothing. In the military, it was, yes, sir, over here is like, what you looking at? In the military, there's a bond and respect from other men. Out here, there's often a disrespect. Many of those guys, 15 years in the military, finally get out, come. After one year, boom, they go back to the military. Let me tell you something. A lot of men here, they work in a place where people cuss at them. They work in an industry where people speak vulgar and cuss at them. 
But men respect men. Men respect men. There's a line that the co-workers know. I'm not going to cross that line. But they come home and the wife and sometimes even the kids cross that line all day long till the sun come down. There's the battle for your time, for your mind, for your heart. And I'm in the battle with you. And I'm going to say, we're losing. We're losing. About a year ago, I was on a panel with pastors. And on the panel was a pastor of one of the largest churches in Houston, one of the largest churches in Southeast Houston. The largest church in Southeast Houston, one of the largest churches in Houston. And they asked him a question. He was retiring. They asked him a question. He answered the question, but then he just kept on talking. He kept, I hate to say this, he kept babbling. He just kept on going and going and going. And all of a sudden, man, he just made things seem so doom and gloom. Mi abuito. El rato mi abuito. And I'm sitting next to him and I'm just like, oh, he's bumming me out. So he finishes talking, and I raise my hand, and I'm like, can I say something? And the, old, the guy that was, that was leading the panel looks at me, and he's like, yes, Pastor Ruben, please say something. And I said, it's rough out there, but it's not all doom and gloom. We're in the battle. The enemy is rough and tough. The enemy's been roughing us up. The enemy has been winning in the front that we call time. The enemy has been winning in the front that we call our mind. The enemy has been winning in the front that we call our heart. But let me tell you, you are here today. And because you are here in God's house of worship today, there is hope. Why? Because as long as the church is here, the Holy Spirit is here. And if the Holy Spirit is with us, there is hope. Hope for us to continue going forward. Hope for us to stand up. Hope for us to fight. And hope for us to win. You have the Spirit of Christ in you. And because the Spirit of Christ is in you, you're not just a conqueror. You are more than conqueror. Death couldn't hold him down. Nothing can hold you down. Continue going forward, soldier. Get up and continue marching forward. That's November on my birthday. I shared with you guys five lessons I learned over the past few years. And one of the lessons was cowboy up. I know some of you men, that's what you need to hear today. Cowboy up. Get up. Dust yourself off. Be the husband you need to be. Be the father you need to be. Let me land this jumbo plane we've been in. <laughs> What's the strategy? If a man was to come to me after church and tell me, Pastor, I'm having problems with my wife. If a father was to come up to me after church and say, Pastor, I'm having problems with my children. If a man was to come up to me after church and say, Pastor, I'm having problems with my finances. Okay? If a man was to come up to me after church and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm struggling with pornography. Pastor, I have an addiction that I can't... Let me tell you, to every single one of those men, I would give them the same answer and it is the same strategy that you and I are going to implement so that next year, 2023, Pastor Ruben will give you the prize of Father of the Year. What's the strategy? Buscar primeramente el reino de Dios y su justicia y todo lo demás vendrá por añadura. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything shall be added unto you. In other words, put God first. Put God first. You having trouble with your wife? Start seeking the Lord. You having trouble with your kids? Start seeking the Lord. You having trouble with your finances? Start seeking the Lord. You having trouble with pornography? Start seeking the Lord. Put God first. Begin to develop a heart for God and you will see that everything else is going to fall in its place. Put God first. Put God first. If you will put God first, if you will draw upon your heavenly father, you see that you're going to be a better father. I married some good friends of my wife and I last weekend. And I reminded them 
I reminded the, the groom that as the groom, he represents Jesus Christ. And I reminded the bride that as the bride, she represents the church. And I remind you, fathers, that when Jesus, the Son of God, came to this earth, listen up, fathers, and Jesus looked all around at all of the roles and the titles. He saw the Caesars. He saw the senators. He saw the pilots. He saw the centurions. He looked at the military and he saw the, he looked at the religious people. He looked at government, he looked at the military. He looked at the religious people. He saw the high priest and the priest. He looked all around. He looked at the religion. He looked at the, the military. He looked at the government. And when it came time to relay the message of what our God, the sovereign one, is like, he chose the term Father. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. And there's a portion in the Gospel of John where Jesus is praying to his heavenly Father and he says, Father, I have shown them your name. What is the name? Father. And the Bible shows us that the Holy Spirit is in you and the Holy Spirit is prompting you. It's moving you to pray and to pray. Abba, Father. Abba is like saying Daddy. This is why there's an assault on fathers today. Because you represent your heavenly father. And if the devil can, can destroy you, then he can destroy the perception of your children when the pastor teaches on our heavenly father. But if at home you can be an amazing father, then you strengthen the perception, the teaching of our heavenly Father. Dads, your community needs you. Your church needs you. Your family needs you. Your children need you. We need you. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you for everyone that today here at Pueblo's Church said present. I thank you for every dad that had the courage to say, let's go to church before we go eat. Let's go to church before we go celebrate. Ask, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would protect them. I know so many of them are walking around wounded and hurt. They have their own daddy wounds, their own father wounds. They have their own wounds that they carry from when they were a little kid or when they were a teenager. Some, some walk around with the wound of abandonment. They're, they never knew their dad. But we thank you that you are our dad. You are our heavenly father. And even when we mess up, you receive us with arms wide open. And when we fall, you lift us up. You dust us off. And you help us to continue to march forward. Father, help us to win the battle, the battlefront of time, of our minds, and of our hearts. That we could represent you and represent you well. In Jesus' name we pray, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. amen.